Hello and welcome to another TLDR EU video. With Brexit negotiations appearing to hit a brick wall, we thought it was time to step back and look at the EU's other negotiations, past, present and future. Specifically looking at where negotiations have failed in the past, where they've succeeded and where they're ongoing. This series was originally only meant to cover three agreements, Norway, Australia and New Zealand, and TTIP, but nonetheless, we asked you what you wanted to see next, and the call for a Japan video was overwhelming, and we couldn't resist. So in this video, we're going to take a look at what's been touted as the world's biggest trade deal, covering nearly a third of global GDP and 635 million people, the EU-Japan trade deal. If you have any other suggestions of other trade deals we should cover, then leave them in the comments. Also, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, as most of you aren't, and if you do subscribe and hit the bell icon, you'll be notified next time we release a video in this series. If you've watched any of the videos in this series before, you'll know what comes first, a bit of background. Japan's relationship with the European Union spans a number of years, and is economically significant. In 2002, the EU-Japan Mutual Recognition Agreement entered into force, allowing for, as the name suggests, mutual two-way recognition of certain standards when it comes to tech and pharmaceutical products. In 2003, the Agreement on Cooperation on Anti-Competition Activities was concluded, establishing a level playing field when it comes to competition policy domestically. In 2004, a cooperation framework was established to promote two-way investment. In 2008, an agreement on cooperation and mutual administrative assistance on customs matters entered into force, and in 2009, a science and technology agreement was signed. And besides all of these formal agreements, Japan and the EU are regularly side by side when it comes to business and economic cooperation be it through round tables or simply informal dialogue. Japan is ultimately the EU's second largest trading partner in Asia, only falling after China, while Japan is the second largest partner for the EU's trade in goods. Over the last three years, EU-Japan trade in goods has surpassed 100 billion euros, with imports and exports relatively balanced between the two sides. Unlike other trade partners, there is not a significant trade imbalance, at least on the good side. Something that's markedly changed since 2009, when the EU's trading goods deficit hit 18 billion euros. On the services side, however, there is an imbalance, to the tune of 13 billion euros, with the EU exporting far, far more than it imports from Japan. Regardless, some seven years ago, on the 25th of March 2013, negotiations between the European Union and Japan were formally launched, with a view to concluding a so-called economic partnership agreement, with a focus on two key areas. High Japanese customs taxes, which stood at nearly 40% for beef and 30% for chocolate, as well as awkward rules known as non-tariff barriers, made things difficult for Europe. In an infographic, the EU stresses that Japan has long and costly procedures to approve each variety of fruit. This discourages EU exporters from trying to get all of the necessary approvals. Something replicated in the EU's justification for negotiating a trade deal with Japan, where they say, Japan is a big market for EU exports. As a rich country of 127 million people, Japan holds huge potential for EU firms to export even more. But European firms face a lot of trade barriers when exporting to Japan, such as high import duties and procedures and standards different from international standards, which make it hard for them to compete. The EU wants a trade deal with Japan to remove trade barriers, help the EU and Japan shape global trade rules in line with our high standards and our shared values of democracy and rule of law, and send a powerful signal that two of the world's biggest economies reject protectionism. In an outline by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, the agreement is regarded as an important pillar of Abenomics growth strategy referring to a set of economic policies enacted by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, in an attempt to, in the Japanese government's own words, revive the Japanese economy after two decades of delation, all while maintaining fiscal discipline. With the outline continuing, in regard to the Japanese economy, 
The Economic Partnership Agreement is estimated to increase real GDP by approximately 1%, approximately 5 trillion yen, and employment by approximately 0.5%, or 290,000 jobs. All in all, creating one of the largest free and advanced economic zones in the world, with approximately 30% of the world's GDP and 40% of world trade. By concluding the EPA, Japan and the EU set a model of trade liberalisation to the world as the flag bearers for free trade. In an impact assessment published by the European Commission recommending the start of negotiations, four scenarios were considered. Two conservative ones where no more than a quarter of non-tariff barriers were reduced, both asymmetrical, referred to as B1, and symmetrical, referred to as B2 as well as the more ambitious outcomes where half of the costs would be tackled, again in an asymmetrical scenario referred to as B3 and a symmetrical referred to as B4. Under both conservative scenarios, Japan would receive a GDP boost of 0.27% in the region of 5.1 billion euros, with the ambitious scenario leading to a 0.67% boost, equivalent to 13.2 billion euros in the asymmetric scenario and 18.3 in the symmetric scenario. The picture for the EU is more nuanced. Under B1, GDP would be boosted by 0.34%, or 42 billion euros. Under B2, that figure rises to 0.75%, or 92 .8 billion euros. Under B3, this again rises to 0.79%, or 99 .8 billion euros. And under the final B4 scenario, this jumps to 1.88%, or 319.3 billion euros. So it's clear that both sides have a significant amount of gain from an agreement like this. But enough of the hypotheticals, what has actually been agreed? The agreement, in spite of its bland economic name, is quite broad with three items. Getting rid of tariffs, getting rid of obstacles to trade, and showing the world that the EU and Japan reject protectionism. The deal, in the first degree, scraps duties on 97 and 99% of Japanese and European imports respectively, with a billion euros of tariffs progressively reduced. When it comes to obstacles, Japanese rules are set to be brought in line with international norms, rules which at present, according to some companies, make it between 10 to 30% more expensive to export to Japan. Geographical indicators, the rules which dictate the origin of products, such as the fact that champagne must come from the Champagne region of France, are also to be protected, and the agreement also commits to not undercutting environmental or labour protections, preventing a race to the bottom, as well as maintaining the right to keep public services public. Many have cited this as a new chapter in Japan's role as a free trade champion. As the BBC reports, Japan has not historically been that active in free trade talks internationally, but now that's changed. It led negotiations to salvage the Pacific trade deal after the US pulled out. That and its EU deal mean that 2019 has already seen Japan enter a free trade sphere of 1 billion euros. Again, talking to the BBC, Japan's ambassador to Singapore highlighted the drive behind this new approach. Our country does not produce natural resources. Our strength is that we have people. A quite well-educated population that is fairly diligent in doing things. And in order to utilise that asset, we have to have more interaction with the outside world. And that definitely means free trade and creating a more liberalised investment climate. This deal is also quite unique in that it specifically and explicitly includes a climate component. The EU-Japan agreement is the first struck with the EU to include a specific provision on the Paris Climate Accord. With the very agreement stressing, the parties recognise the importance of achieving the ultimate objective on the United Nations framework on climate change, in order to address the urgent threat of climate change and the role of trade to that end. The parties reaffirm their commitments to effectively implement the Paris Agreement, and shall cooperate to promote the positive contribution of trade to the transition to low greenhouse gas emissions and a climate resilient development. So the big question is, is the agreement working in real terms? To mark the first anniversary of the partnership agreement entering into force, figures were published when it comes to export growth. Specifically, meats exported increased by 12%. 
Frozen beef exports have tripled. Dairy exports are up 10.4%, including a 47% increase in butter exports. Beverage exports went up by 20%, with a 17.3% growth in wine exports. Commissioner for Trade Phil Hogan on the anniversary of the deal commented, The EU-Japan trade agreement is benefiting citizens, workers, farmers and companies in Europe and Japan. Openness, trust and commitment to establish rules help deliver sustainable growth in trade. The EU is and will continue to be the largest and most active trading bloc in the world. The EU is a trusted bilateral partner by more than 70 countries, with whom we have the biggest trading network in the world. It's also clear that this agreement is far from the end, rather the beginning of a new, stronger chapter. In May, European Council President Charles Michel and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen held the first bilateral summit with Shinzo Abe since the start of the pandemic. Two, in the words of the FT, buttress an alliance made more crucial by tensions with both China and the EU, with Abe concluding that the growing cooperation between Brussels and Tokyo was a resounding declaration at a time when the values and principles we have held dear waver or drift. What do you think? Is the EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement deep enough, or is there more to tap? And which country's trade deal with the EU should we cover next? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and as always, you can also get involved over on Discord. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we post, including new videos in this series. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name listed at the end of videos just like these people, then be sure to back us on Patreon. There's a link to that in the description.